Uh, thank you again for uh, having me. Uh, my presentation entitled Vegetation by Design. Some of what I'll present today is, is general and it does not at all capture the uh, breadth and spectrum of what our company does, but it will at least give you a primer on how we approach some of the uh, revegetation strategies for large scale land disturbances. So I'll just get with it. I, I think given how late we're starting, I'll skip over some of the uh, introductory um, discussion. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with the distinction between restoration, whoops, uh, reclamation, and rehabilitation. Basically, uh, restoration being the greatest uh, renovation technique where we try to restore full and complete biological and physical um, function of a landscape. Reclamation being more of an intermediate uh, degree of, of renovation and rehabilitation being the le lesser degree. Most of you folks are probably savvy to this uh, concept. Uh, in general, we'll discuss the use of reference sites, but for slope design, uh, rivers and streams and wetland design work, the physical characteristics of the uh, project, whether it be restoration, reclamation, or rehabilitation, is typically done by engineers. And these physical characteristics, these uh, morphometrics associated with the uh, the physical shape of the project or something that I don't necessarily perform and in general the concept of using reference sites is widely embraced by practitioners whether we're talking about a wetland uh, restoration project but we're looking at uh, mimicking natural features as part of our template for whether it be slopes or streams or wetlands. Uh, of course, the very basics as we get involved in these projects is characterization of the soils. Uh, it won't take much time, but physical characterization, uh, particle size distribution, uh, soil physics, soil properties. Uh, then you've got biological characterization. We look at the different uh, types of macro and micro invertebrates, some of the byproducts of the uh, uh, decomposition of organic matter, the humates, uh, some of the other components of root systems that allow uh, plants to thrive, mycorrhizae, and then we have chemical characterization of the soil, uh, basically nutritional analysis and some of the other physical properties of soils won't go into that. I'm making the presumption that you have studied or are familiar with some of these uh, uh, terms and, uh, and acronyms. Uh, so. We jump into these projects after the engineers have done their magic and much of the permitting has already been complete. What we often find ourselves doing is changing particle size distribution through adding or subtracting different uh, size classes of materials, uh, ripping, harrowing, rolling, imprinting. We'll look at some of those uh, surface uh, techniques for physical amendment, biological amendment. Of course, you can add micro and macro invertebrates. You can add compost, biochar, um, fulvic acids, the, the uh, complement of humates, those byproducts of um, decomposition of organic matter, uh, inoculations. Uh, you can uh, complement with different plant species like legumes, which are nitrogen fixers. <clears throat> and then a chemical amendment we find ourselves doing quite often. Uh, polymers, which I'll discuss a um, petrochemical fertilizers that you're probably aware of, at least that they exist, uh, acids and buffers and trace elements. <coughs> I, I can't see that hardly at all. Uh, okay. Uh, so, as I mentioned, our company, you know, hits the ground running. It's kind of a front line uh, service that we provide. We call this, a lot of this environmental field services, but I work in the mining industry and and we have at our disposal rather large equipment. Uh, here we are, seed bread preparation. This dozer is just imprinting uh, grouser tracks, uh, which form ideal seed bed, uh, solely for the purpose of revegetation. The final contouring has already been complete. They're just giving me a, a seed bed preparation technique, which is very advantageous. This is one of our, our equipment. Uh, we're ripping a loading area, uh, alleviating the compaction. It's a, you know, a physical treatment of the soil. 
And so we find ourselves often doing that type of work to uh, prepare seed bed or a growth medium. <coughs> um, many of you may be familiar with some of these uh, biological amendment technologies, but uh, mycorrhizal inoculation, in general, it enhances the root structure of the plants the, that your, your ambition is to reestablish uh, through extending the, the filaments that uh, are attached to the original plant biomass and increases water and nutrient absorption. So that's an example of a biological amendment. Humates, uh, humic and fulvic acids are these byproducts of decomposition of organic matter and are basically the building blocks of soils and uh, enhance the uh, development and maturation of soil. Uh, of course, we're familiar with fertilizers, but we have used on many occasions the anionic polyacrylamides, uh, APAMs. Uh, there's the chemical structure. I wanted to discuss these very briefly, but this is a very controversial uh, chemical treatment of soil. They have been, uh, the APAMs have been used in flocculation of turbidity. They've gone, undergone decades of testing for toxicities, both acute and chronic. Uh, they've been approved for drinking water treatment, potable waters. What I thought was most interesting is I found at a conference in Denver this winter that in Colorado, for example, they can use APAMs to treat potable water, but they cannot use them as a soil amendment. So we can drink this product, but we can't walk on it. So I thought that was quite a conundrum there. Why would that be? And I don't have an answer, but at least maybe for some of you have an interest. Uh, it would be worth a topic that would be worth investigating. Uh, the basics of uh, polyacrylamides, a very long uh, cross-link polymer chains. Uh, they can be blended for your specific soil lithology. Uh, to maximize that stabilization characteristic. They uh, often are used with uh, hydroceding mixtures to carry other amendments. So they will be mixed into solution either with seeds, uh, with um, and nutritional complements. They're uh, highly hydrophilic. Uh, they tend to form a very secure interlocking bonds between soil particles. They also affect the pore space and infiltration capacity of clay soils. So we have a, a lot of advantages that polyacrylamides offer in terms of stabilizing soil in advance of revegetating. So we can put seed in a mixture with polyacrylamide, spray it onto a slope, and the, the polyacrylamide would enhance seed germination and stabilize the soil surface. Uh, very briefly, as we approach seed uh, plant selection, of course, now I'm not a, a landscape architect and not even a botanist, but in general, you know, for grasses, for example, you know, we make decisions on annual versus perennial, uh, different life forms like bunch grasses, turf grasses, sod formers. You, as the designer, will become familiar with these groups of plants and what their functions are and how they might complement the uh, the habitat and or provide forage. So we go through this decision making tree if you will uh, when we select our species that we desire. Of course Forbes, it could be annual, biennial, perennial. We might prefer wildflowers to uh, enhance our seed mix design for aesthetic purposes. Uh, shrubs, we'll discuss in a minute some of our favorite shrubs, uh, often used for complementing so slope stability, but primarily as a habitat component and a forage for wildlife. Uh, wetlands, again, the same applies. You have a variety of species to choose from. It's uh, often a preference of the landowner, but we have to interject some of our advices and recommendations, especially when we're using willows uh, to stabilize stream banks, we need to keep in mind that some willows are intolerant of highly alkaline soils and do not proliferate in clayey soils. Um, sedges and rushes, of course, we know that they exist. They're obligate wetland species or, or groups of uh, plants. But I think one of the interesting uh, 
aspects of using wetland plants now that's coming out as maybe uh, a new trend is using them in passive wetland treatment for uh, the uh, treatment of storm waters, polluted waters, and there's a, a huge body of literature out there right now that actually has demonstrated the rates of absorption that sedges and rushes have for different types of nutrients. So when we build bioswales, we might select for a specific group of sedges and rushes that are most effective at uh, absorbing and uh, stabilizing uh, uh, contaminants. And now we just get some of my favorite plants. And again, I'm not a landscape uh, architect nor a botanist, but we do a lot of uh, field gathering of basin wild rice seed. The seed heads are, you know, cigar sized. You, they're very easy to collect. Uh, it's a very uh, aggressive plant in terms of rate of establishment. We also do a lot of planting of plugs and potted plants of basin wild rye. Um, and one of my other favorites, it, very indicative of a bunch grass, uh, blue bunch wheatgrass. Uh, somewhat difficult to get established, but it has a, a exceptional uh, palatability for wildlife. So all I'm trying to demonstrate here is that the designer has a lot of flexibility on picking and choosing from you know, literally thousands of species uh, depending on the objectives of the project. I use a lot of western yarrow partly because it's very rapidly established. It has a significant and extensive rhizomatous root mass. Uh, it will occupy dry sites, moist sites. Uh, we can use it in stream bank seed mixes. We can use it in uh, transition area uh, mixes. And they will also occupy uh, droughty sites. And so it has a, a very distinct function. Whereas uh, blue flax, very showy. Uh, it rejuvenates its flowers every day. It's a wildflower, a native wildflower. And sometimes you just want to jazz it up, right? You just want to put things in there that are attractive and, and snazzy and your client may like. Again, we deal with very large projects, but nonetheless, we like a little diversity and a little color in some of our projects. Um, some of our favorite and most used shrubs, <coughs> woods rose, intermediate in stature, typically uh, two, but no more than three meters tall. Uh, very easy to establish, very dense uh, a stem uh, configuration so it can be a, a, an effective barrier between units of your landscape. It is also very complementary to neotropical birds, for example. They like the little berries uh, that are you know, kind of uh, highly palatable. So not only do they have function, but they also have some aesthetic value in that they'll bring in uh, neotropical and other, uh, other bird species. We do a lot with the fringe sedge, more so because it has an, an enormous and extensive root mass, and so thus stabilizing soils. It's also a, an exceptional a forage for deer and elk, and, but not so much for livestock, uh, uh, cows and, and horses and whatnot. Uh, willows in Montana, of course, that could take up the entire semester. Uh, but uh, just an example of the two extremes, we use a lot of booth willow because it is so easily transplanted. It will thrive from cuttings. It is uh, tolerant of pH uh, variability. It's uh, kind of a, an early successional stage plant. So we can take cuttings, we can uh, plant uh, containerized plants of booth willow and with a high degree of success, a very high germination rate. Uh, on the other extreme is the beb willow, almost tree-like in stature. If you are in riparian areas and you see a willow-like uh, plant like this, the, the tree, the trunks are uh, corky bark. They're really heavy, uh, structurally very large, uh, up, upwards of five to seven meters. Uh, they don't transplant well. Uh, they're very long-lived. So in terms of habitat function, they work really well for holding and hiding cover for white-tailed deer, for example, uh, but they're not easy to establish or transplant. And so we're just kind of touching on some of the cool plants that we like to use a lot. Uh, seed mix design and planting design. Now again, they're in the realm of um, uh, landscape architecture, but it's important to recognize the difference between pure live seed, 
versus bulk seed and understand germination rates and purity and how pure life seed is uh, calculated. Uh, there are seed mix calculators out there, both commercial or you can just, uh, with an Excel spreadsheet, make your own seed mix calculator. But what we're striving for is to get the right number of seeds, uh, either in pounds or individual seed count per acre. And of course, we know that some seeds might be 30,000 seeds per pound and some might be 500,000 seeds per pound. And so knowing that helps you design your seed mix for efficiency and efficacy. <laughs> Uh, this controversy over native versus non-native, I mean, that again would probably at least consume an entire presentation. You know, those, um, the paradigm within uh, seed design mix, native versus non-native is kind of maybe inappropriate for this discussion, but we do need to be cognizant <coughs> of that uh, controversy. Uh, I often look at uh, grass forb shrub ratios as a, a way of uh, initially at least uh, the, the fundamental design framework. Uh, what we find ourselves doing is uh, designing cover crops, erosion control seed mixes, uh, fire resistant seed mixes, and in some occasions ornamental seed mixes. Uh, your source of seed is critical. Uh, the closer to your project, the more locally adapted that, that seed will be. And so we typically recommend that you gather your seed from within about 200 miles of your source area. But if you can collect it right on site, you know you have uh, a well-adapted uh, ecotype that uh, will suit your site needs. Uh, the debate over habitat versus function versus aesthetics, aesthetics that kind of relates back to restoration versus reclamation, uh, function versus form. But it's to be considered. Uh, one of the most interesting aspects that I've seen come out of seed mix design considerations is the inherent resistance of native plants and non-native plants to herbicides. And Dr. Rice out of U of M and Monica Picorni, who is now with the NRCS, has done an enormous amount of, of research on what specific plants are resistant to common herbicides. So you may anticipate the need for herbicides in your uh, long-term management of a project, and it may affect your choices in terms of your seed mix design. Highly resistant to a certain herbicide that you think you might use. We also need to consider the herbicide residual that's in soils. Many of our projects are legacy projects, um, old mining sites that have um, been exposed to herbicide application with very long-lived herbicides that are uh, still uh, active in the soil. And so <clears throat> it's a, a good thing to be aware of the possibility or the certainty that your site has already been contaminated with an herbicide. And then we've discussed uh, mycorrhizal inoculations, but you'll often find, <clears throat> particularly in um, rehabilitation projects, uh, the seed has been treated with a fungicide, uh, somewhat of an irritant to the applicator. It's just good to know that that's an option if you've got long-term storage issues and that many of your products might already have uh, inoculations that could be detrimental to your health or at least that you need to be aware of. I design uh, many of our projects with species that resist weed encroachment. Um, Bozoisky wild rye, uh, needle and thread. Uh, these are two species that are inherently tenacious against knapweed. And so we'll talk a little bit about knapweed. Uh, I think it's uh, germane to uh, butte in particular. <clears throat> you said needle and thread what? It, it resists the encroachment of knapweed. Okay. And what was the other one? Uh, Bozoisky wild rye. Uh, but, and there are other species, but the point being is that there is a significant amount of information out there that demonstrates the, the in, inherent tenacity of certain species to resist weed encroachment. And so that's a good consideration when you're planning for a project that's going to take 10 or 20 years to uh, fully mature. Uh, okay, well anyway, so rate of establishment, you know, from a practical standpoint, when we're dealing with the, a dust control or rapid stabilization of a temporary topsoil stockpile in a mining operation, we want to get a seed out there like an annual ryegrass that'll germinate within days of, of um, uh, contact with moisture <clears throat> versus waiting for two to three years or longer for a native plant to, uh, a native seed species to germinate. Uh, 
there's a lot of literature out there on shear strengths of root masses, uh, NRCS, uh, HEC 15 is a, a large compendium of um, flume tested um, grass species primarily that demonstrate the, the strength of the root mass of a given grass. So if you're looking at erosion control on a stream bank, you might refer to such a document or you might just know some of the characteristics of the different grass species so that you have an inherently erosion resistant stream bank. Uh, so that information is out there. Uh, you know, from a plant design standpoint, we strive to achieve some kind of diversity for, uh, you know, to enhance the functional uh, aspect for habitat. And so we don't want all one age class, we don't want all one species. Uh, often we'll try to break up the foreground, midground, and background with short, middle, and tall stature plants. You know, it's an aesthetic approach to your plant design, but that vertical stature is something you don't, you don't want the tallest plants up front and the shortest plants in the back. Uh, your client wouldn't be able to appreciate the, the creativity of your um, efforts. Uh, we might mimic succession, but in reality, it all boils down to cost. And so you need to track the seed market, uh, the seed availability, and the, you know, the source areas, highly volatile, volatile market. Uh, what affects your cost when you get down to the practitioner level is your calibration of your seeding equipment. Uh, cyclone seeders, which are used for broadcast seeding, tend to uh, um, not allow one to tightly calibrate the pounds per acre of your seed application versus a drill seeding operation where you know, you're very precisely applying the specific amount of pounds per acre that you uh, want to achieve. So you get tw plus or minus 20% from a broadcasting operation. If you're spending $10,000 on seed, plus or minus 20% might get you fired. Uh, you also have to consider predation by animals. Uh, we know that rodents, for example, can eat their weight in seed in a matter of one to two days. And so I see uh, flocks of birds following me around when I'm seeding. And you have you know, three or four hundred birds just literally just chasing you as you traverse back and forth across the slope. And then they stay there for weeks. So these, these features, you know, wind loss, you know, small seeds, of course, are going to blow away when you try to broadcast them onto the landscape. I generally pad my seed mix uh, maybe plus 20% just so I don't run short at the end of the project, have to order the seed, find out that what I really want is no longer available or it's three times the cost. And that really does happen within a matter of weeks, especially around fire season where the um, federal agencies will buy up all the native seed no longer available and then all of a sudden you've got 20% of your project left and you don't have the seed that you need. So for a variety of reasons, pad your seed mix order. Plan for noxious weeds. You know, state, well, federal, state, and county laws require noxious weed control. It is not an option. They can send out a, a contractor or a county crew and charge you through your property taxes. And of course, I'm not referring to you necessarily, but if you are a large landowner, you can be assessed the cost of weed control whether you want it or not. Uh, who cares? We'll talk about that. Uh, our different options for control and maybe briefly discuss toxicity and environmental considerations. Uh, who cares? Well, you may or may not understand the logic behind uh, designation of noxious weeds, but they're invasive and destructive plants that are f from other continents, basically. And it, the emphasis being on destructive. So you know, plants that are, have few native biological controls and spread very rapidly and are very deleterious to some aspect of your uh, intentions on land use, you know, the counties will usually designate that as a noxious weed. Uh, allelopathic characteristics are common in noxious weeds, meaning that they exude toxic compounds that kill the surrounding vegetation. Uh, knapweed is one of those species that has a, a zinc laden compound that actually is toxic to most native vegetation. Thus, it spreads rapidly and diminishes the uh, ground cover of other species. Uh, one of the strongest rationale for designating uh, an invasive species as uh, noxious is that it's toxic to livestock in particular, and sometimes in some cases man. But so if you've got uh, uh, 100 horses that you like 
Uh, horses are particularly vulnerable to a couple of the noxious weeds that cause blindness in your horses. That would be a problem as a landowner to host noxious weeds of that type. Uh, of course, loss of productivity. Um, I think we'll touch on this. Um, my pet peeve is the loss of soil in your uh, restoration projects. But for a variety of reasons, noxious weeds often lead to dramatic increases in erosion. And the real bottom line, when you're working on a fixed budget and all of a sudden you're faced with uh, 10 or 12 man days of weed control, that just blows your budget and also affects your success of your project. Uh, for example, you know, and it is the law, uh, 52 plant species are designated noxious in Montana. These are the main nasties out there in the playground, priority 2B, and uh, the others, you know, we may not necessarily warrant your attention, but I'm sure you're familiar with leafy spurge, uh, white top, spotted knapweed, Dalmatian toad flax. Those are some of the worst players in the game, and they're hard to control. Uh, these other species are of lesser importance, but there's 22 of them that you're going to commonly encounter. Uh, some statistics. Uh, this, I think, is the greatest. Uh, Lacey and Marlow from MSU found that you know your runoff and your sediment yields are un increased under knapweed, and this figure is probably more like 60 or 80 million a year in Montana now. Hound stung. I mean, many of you have seen this on your pets on livestock. Uh, it, the hound's tongue is extremely alkaloid and toxic to uh, many livestock and uh, ungulates. It uh, causes the blindness, uh, sun sensitivity. It festers in their uh, inaccessible parts of their bodies and causes infections. And that's the mature plant, which is rampant and very dominant in riparian areas. So if you're working with uh, streamside restoration projects, you're likely to encounter hound's tongue. Very quickly, we have selective herbicides. They've been around for a long time. They are designed to affect forbs without injuring grasses. Most noxious weeds are forbs, so you can apply a selective herbicide that will not, at appropriate rate, injure your grasses but kill the, the target uh, forb species. Uh, they're uh, absorbed through foliar or root absorption and typically systematic, meaning they trans the, the active ingredients are translocated into the roots, a highly effective tool. Uh, Non-selective herbicides, they'll kill forbs, grasses, shrubs, trees. Glyphosate, which is Roundup, has gotten a lot of attention in the news uh, for GMO uh, plants in agriculture and also now been nominated by at least one international agency as a potential carcinogen. Uh, one of the most widely used herbicides in the history of man. Uh, post and pre-emergent, basically you put some of these products down in the ground before or after the plants have come up. Environmental restrictions. I gleaned this one study out of many, so it isn't necessarily representative of uh, all parts of America, but this out of Iowa and Illinois, where we've got concentrated uh, centuries of agriculture and population. But I think what a lot of people don't recognize is that our urban streams are uh, often polluted with some of these types of products. Um, we use ALS inhibitors and in synthetic auxins. Uh, of course, the ALS inhibitors uh, stop the production of amino acids and block enzyme function. A common product name is Escort. Uh, synthetic auxins. Uh, of course, the growth, natural auxins are growth regulators. You're disrupting cell growth. These are common product names that you may have heard of. Uh, the microtubular inhibitors, they're a pre-emergent product in agriculture, but a whole lot of these are photosynthetic inhibitors. Uh, they, they block photosynthesis, they destroy chlorophyll, and so they're interrupting processes that plants depend on for sustenance. And paraquat being uh, a notorious uh, photosynthesis inhibitor. Uh, very quickly, common chemical name, uh, chemical group, par paradigm carboxylic acid, uh, chemical structure, we already talked about the mode of action, uh, 
Uh, virtually non-toxic, according to the EPA, category four out of one through four. Uh, this is a massive dose, uh, oral dose of active ingredient for rats. So you gotta have over a cup of active ingredient per pound of rat to kill the rat. You know, LD50, you're probably familiar with lethal, lethal dose of 50% of the population. Uh, some of the physical uh, properties of these herbicides are important, like half-life. Uh, they will decompose at given rates. Uh, this is a fairly short half-life. Uh, photo degradation in water, uh, highly mob mo mobile. Your uh, coefficient of mobility is low, thus your mobility is high. And so it will disperse in soil and water very rapidly. Something you might want to know before you put it into uh, an area where there's uh, abundance of uh, uh, sensitive vegetation. In contrast, you know, you're in sulfur on uh, ureas. I think we need to skip on to this, but uh, intermediate half-life, a long photo degradation rate, moderately mobile, not so friendly to uh, the aquatic environment. And so you have to know your toxicities, your mobilities, some of the physical properties in order to prescribe the appropriate treatment. And so how do we do this? Now we're getting into just pictures and fun stuff. But, you know, a remote control uh, sprayer on a UTV, a uh, backpack sprayer with a nurse tank and on an ATV. Uh, this is a little bit bigger operation. We've got a, a numerous employees here. Uh, here's a, a mixed, pre-mixed mixture. They're filling up their tanks. We've got water. We've got another uh, mobile unit uh, broadcast spraying through a large truck, basically dispersing an even curtain of pre-mixed solution. You have mechanical control options. Uh, we use a clearing saw for very precise decimation of these plants. This is our machine now with the uh, sickle bar and the brush cutter on it. You basically, through cutting, you're starving the plant. You're reducing the carbohydrate uh, content of the above ground biomass so it can't feed itself in the fall when it wants to draw that carbohydrates into the roots. You're also eliminating its ability to photosynthesize. So there's a lot of utility in certain species to just cut the weeds. Uh, one of our biological controls is through insects, basically moths, beetles, weevils, and flies. Uh, they are limited by severe cold and dry climates, like that of Beaverhead in Madison County. Uh, here's the bad girl on the block, uh, the knapweed root weevil. Very effective on knapweed. Lays about 100 eggs in the root, and those uh, larvae just decimate the stems of the individual knapweed plants. Uh, so far, this is the most promising of our uh, insect biocontrols. We have another technology on the horizon whether we like it or not, introducing weed suppressive bacteria, uh, pseudonomous fluorescine strain, I'll call it D7, which is the, the trade name. Uh, it, was, it is for sale in numerous states, western states now. It was available for commercial applicators last year, but it was pulled from the market by the Montana Department of Agriculture. Anyways, it employs a different approach to weed control and is predominantly used on uh, grasses, but it attacks the seed bank within the soil. So one of the strategies has been to kill the individual plants and the above ground biomass. This type of bacteria gets into the soil, thrives in the soil, and destroys the residual seed. Okay, so it's kind of a, a different way of attacking um, the problem. Cultural Controls, cutting, grazing, flood irrigation, tilling, cropping, burial. Some of them are very effective. This is where we jump in. Uh, we've got many hundreds of projects now. Uh, this is just review of what I just talked about. So uh, Odell Spring Creek. <laughs> the reason I think this is significant, of course, Odell Spring Creek restoration is one of the foremost and uh, uh, legacy projects in the West, not just Montana. But most people would see this as a natural landscape. Uh, the, the stream banks and floodplains have been physically reconstructed. Uh, dwarf willows have been planted. This woody component here is sustained by uh, ditch um, seepage. And on top of the bench here is a, a pivot irrigation. So these return flows through the substrate are actually 
allowing for the woody component to exist. And these emergent wetland species, cattails, are also sustained by agriculture and by the abundance of water that's flowing through from the terraces above and leaking out of the active irrigation ditches. So most people would say, oh, that's a natural setting. But it's heavily modified by man. We jump in once the big boys get their work done. They import the gravels. They pull the banks back. Uh, here's the owner. Uh, as the construction crew leaves, we jump in behind them. Different size cedars for different size seed. Some of the typical strategies, sod replacement. The, the excavators will actually harvest appropriate sod and place it onto the bank so they're physically reconstructing the size and width and depth of the bank with live sod, leaving the floodplain unvegetated. A little more complex scenario here, we've got some upland uh, component to the uh, stream construction. We've got side springs that are, you know, sustaining emergent wetlands. And uh, we, then we have just pullback of banks. You've got vertical banks that are being pulled back to about three to one. And so the upper bank has to be seeded with a upland compatible grass or forb. And the lower bank uh, adjacent to the sod mat has to be seeded with a separate group of species. Therein lies three or four seed mixes for any one given site. So, you know, the designer gets to have a whole lot of fun putting this uh, collage together. Uh, natural channel design, all of this is man-made. All of the spawning gravels were imported from other sites. All the point bars are uh, are composed of imported gravels. Uh, the width depth ratio sinuosity is all part of an engineering design based on the hydraulics. Uh, somewhat complex restoration project, uh, Stringer Island adjacent to a pond with mid pond islands, uh, springs emerging from the sides, and seasonally wet banks. So we've got again three or four different microsites that we have to design our, our plant and seed mix for. There's the boss. Uh, this is what she says to me. <clears throat> we have some weeds in here. This is an older seeding that is recovered uh, to the point where uh, it's nearly successful. This is maybe uh, the end result of about five years of, of uh, seed and plant establishment. And now we're considering coming back in and introducing willows as kind of an afterthought based on the landowner's preference. Uh, Upland seeding, I mean, that's how fast this can recover. One year, uh, more upland site with some uh, Canada thistle coming in, but this is less than a year. Uh, this is just kind of a question mark. Uh, the, the types of banks we're treating, uh, major sediment sources, uh, they result in over widening of the channel. This is not Odell Spring Creek, but you know, over widening and sediment cause nutrient and thermal issues. So we've got an example of a, a diverse age class and diverse species on one side and in contrast your Kentucky bluegrass or, or red top vegetation on the opposite side, you know, two contrasting uh, scenarios. Or elsewhere on the, the um, Madison, a 30 foot bank overhanging the Madison River, got your woods rose, your fringe sedge, a couple different types of uh, rabbit brush, uh, uh, tridentata, tridentata, the uh, uh, three tip sage, and we got to rappel down in there, and the boss is lowering plants down to us. Uh, mine reclamation, about 1,000 acres of disturbance. These slopes we've been working on for 20 years, getting them revegetated. Uh, this is a pr uh, slope in progress. Uh, the Regal mine is about 200 acres of disturbance, the pit. Uh, these are final reclaimed slopes, uh, temporary seed mixes. Uh, cover crops used on the topsoil piles because the topsoil piles will be used within two or three years. So we've got different objectives for revegetating those surfaces. One of our technical reports that we prepared, uh, we installed 200 dozer basins on a, a deeply eroded mine slope that was not successfully revegetating. Uh, this, this is just an example of some of our um, soil amendment treatments and some of these are just the native seeds that we tested, but we also tested some of the introduced species. Uh, but we had a, a large number of test plots. Uh, the results are proprietary. Uh, the, the results belong to Barrett's Minerals, and I'm not at the liberty to share them with you. Here's the, the industrial complex south of Dillon, the top processing plant. 
some final reclamation here. Uh, we'll be working on these uh, tailings ponds. Here's phase one. It's hard to see, but that's very successful revegetation with uh, Oahe intermediate wheatgrass and some uh, Luna pubescent um, wheatgrass. Here's phase two, just the soil, appropriate soils being in, in place. Uh, containment berms, maybe you've heard of some of the enormous disasters of tailing burn failures. Uh, this is our fire resistant seed mix, a uh, uh, falcata alfalfa, a um, thick spike wheatgrass, I believe it's cretana, and uh, oh yes, road crest, crested wheatgrass, very low growing form of crested. So we, we're right up against the railroad right away. We don't want to introduce a fire hazard into an industrial complex. A little bit of mustard, a couple noxious weeds on the side there, but that's very successful given the alkalinity and fine textured soils that we're working with. And those are unamended soils. One of my favorite success stories, of course, we've got to cap these tailings ponds very thickly. We have lost a dozer into one of the soft spots. Uh, we needed a crane to pull it out. Uh, this is four months later. But this is an example of use of annual and perennial grasses, but they're all non-native grasses. And the point to drive home is that one of the advantages of using introduced species is that many of those species germinate and establish extremely rapidly. And so we're dealing with fugitive dust issues, EPA and uh, state compliance with air, uh, air quality. So we've got to get rapid cover. Uh, I don't know, am, am I running, am I out of time? Um. Okay, um, we do a lot of borrow pit reclamation. This is a 19 acre site just outside of Divide. Um, you know, we've, we've harrowed to prepare the seed bed. This is the compacted soil from the dozer action. Uh, this is, we're doing reclamation concurrent with the gravel uh, mining process. Uh, these are fairly big. You can see them along the interstate. Uh, there's a, a history of <clears throat> gravel processing, but you know, I think this is incredible given there were no, no soil amendments. Uh, last year this was almost like hay, uh, 19 acres, all we did was harrow seed and harrow. Uh, that was that broken edge where the, uh, I pointed out the harrowing and the topsoil placement. And we got to go back and do the, um, <clears throat> these last gravel pads. So we needed some <clears throat> commercial compost from uh, uh, Butte Compost here. Uh, used to be biologic, but now it's <clears throat> a different company. About 300 yards, which is not a lot given um, the size of the disturbance. And so we've got our, we retrofit our cedars and spreaders and use the same equipment for all these different projects. Uh, seed bed preparation, broadcast seeding, and there's your site. Uh, it did actually uh, initially germinate quite well. Uh, we used alfalfa. Uh, uh, High crest crested here and an intermediate wheatgrass. It was a landowner's preference because he's primarily using this for livestock grazing. Um, and this is a segue into what I hope is the next presentation uh, related to uh, erosion and sediment control best management practices as used in traditional Montana industries like logging, mining. But we chase her, and this is our excavator, and we, we build the pads for the drilling companies, then we go back and reclaim them. But we also provide protection to waterways. Uh, that's a segue into the next presentation, which I hope I will be invited to. Thank you for these folks, Mr. Jeff Laszlo, James Wellington, uh, John Melfield and his uh, River Design Group, the folks at Barrett's Minerals, Brad Watkins, Cody Hagenson, Miss Stacy Hill from Riverside, Dr. Powell, and the owner, Linda Wallant, owner of Basic Biological. I kind of overdid it here with timing, but I would gladly take on a few questions. Yes, ma'am.